behalf of Sankar Global Summit and IntelliCap, I welcome you all to Sankar's virtual 2020 and our session today. Uh, we have a very exciting week ahead of us and a very exciting session ahead. Uh, I have a few housekeeping rules before I hand it over to our partner. Uh, request you to please switch off your video and keep your mics off while the panel is on. on. But however, you feel free to you know, use the chat to share your comments, insights, questions. Uh, I would especially like to thank our session partner, Ankur Capital, for facilitating and curating this session. I hand it over to you, Rema, to take this forward. Thank you, Trina. And thank you for, for uh, putting together this session. Uh, tech, tech has been is all around us all the time. What is tech for good? And um, we're talking of entrepreneurs, businesses, solving for the 95% of the population and not just the 5% premium layer. There is a, a global movement, which is towards uh, um, tech for good, both from entrepreneurs, civil society, consumers, policy makers, funders, from capital providers. You see that today, the demand from everyone looking for tech for good. Tech is being used to solve some of the major problems of society and the environment uh, to enable better products and services that help meet uh, uh, needs and protect our planet. The last decade, India has made a lot of progress in this area. Uh, one has been the fact that there's been a tremendous digital penetration that has happened, which has made us uh, reach the next billion, which till now were on the fringes and were not touched by the development that was happening all around us. Uh, the other interesting thing that was happening was the fact that uh, we, um, Till, till, very, till, till about a decade back, a lot of our technology was towards providing services to the, to the rest of the globe as service providers. What we did see with the digital penetration happening in parallel, we saw entrepreneurs building out products, products and services for them. So from just being a, a service provider to building out businesses on their own using the same cutting edge technology was the next thing that we saw. And the third thing was the fact that along with digital technology, we also saw a lot, we are seeing a lot of investment happening in science and technology. And you have entrepreneurs building out businesses using the science and technology, uh, cutting edge science and technology to address the needs of, uh, of the billions. Um, you know, if you take that today, Aadhaar, which got built out about a decade and a half back, is today being now Recruited as one of the best globally, and is being now looked at going to the other to a lot of other emerging economies to solve the similar uh, issue, or the fintech stack that we built out, or the health stack that is getting built out. We this is the moment we really see is the fact that is India now poised to be uh, it, India is poised to be uh, not only resolving not only providing solutions for our next billion, but also for the next 5 billion globally. I have here with me uh, four entrepreneurs who are um, touching the lives of the next billion in India, who, are, uh, who have some of the cutting edge technologies being deployed in their enterprises. And we're here to hear about their journey, what they have done, what they would do differently what they are looking to uh, invest in and how are they looking to go global. I welcome uh, all four of you, Ranjit from Pratilipi, Karthik from Vekul, Geeta from, um, from uh, Niramai, and Krishna from Krapen. Ranjit, first, over to you. Though we are speaking in English, over to you, to the one who provides voice to the, to the billions uh, who talk in other languages other than English. Sorry, did not realize I was muted. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Ranjit. Uh, I'm one of the founders at Pratilipi. Pratilipi is an Indian language storytelling platform where people can come and share their stories with each other. Uh, so right now we have three formats. The one that we are most commonly known for is literature or text. Uh, where we have about 25 million monthly active readers now, a uh, little more than 3 million stories published 
but we have also launched our comics product where you can read comics currently in one language and our audio product where you can listen to audio podcasts as well as books and stuff like that uh, in eight languages today uh, our thesis at prakriti largely has always been that uh, people should have access to same information uh, and same opportunities irrespective of where they are based or what languages do they speak uh, after that what they do with that opportunity or that access is up to them uh, but not having access to something just because of a language barrier or geography barrier or income barrier is not the kind of world that we should be living in thanks that's really nice um uh, introduction ranjit uh, kartik hi good afternoon everyone my name is kartik jayaraman and uh, i run a supply chain a full stack broadline supply chain company called way cool foods uh, the indian food supply chain is uh, a fairly long supply chain because of both the uh, fragmentation that occurs on the production end as well as in the consumption end however three disruptions uh, we believe have made it possible to create a new kind of supply chain these disruptions are the uh, tremendous improvement in the transport infrastructure in the country which makes it possible for material to move uh, directly uh, the democratization of data and the digitization of money uh, any supply chain comprises the flow of material information and money and we believe these three disruptions that have happened in the past two or three decades make it possible for us to create a new kind of supply chain one that connects the producer whether it is a miller or a farmer as directly as possible in substantial efficiencies the beneficiary of these efficiencies is ultimately the producer who gets a fairer price for the products that they offer and to a significant extent the consumer as well who gets fresher and higher quality products which have uh, deteriorated less uh, we are a re uh, intermediation player over here and the way we re intermediate is using a technology stack as well as a physical automated operation stack that uh, enable direct links between the farmer and the end user we deal with multiple categories and a lot of our technologies are now being productized and there is some global interest in replicating these technologies as well thank you yes kartik and you know it's one of those areas which um, has seen a lot of action uh, this is one area where which has existed for centuries but what you are now defining what you are working on is to create uh, value equal opportunity in terms of partaking the value of that supply chain right i mean earlier it used to be uh, uh, folks were largely playing on the asymmetry of information and you were exploiting one end uh, geeta your sure. uh, hi raymond all uh, good afternoon uh, it's it's great to be part of this uh, forum where all of us are discussing how can tech do good i mean it's, it's wonderful um uh, i'm uh, geeta ceo and founder of niramai health analytics uh, where we are developing a new way of detecting breast cancer in an affordable accessible radiation free automated manner using ai artificial intelligence um so basically what we do is just sort of measure the temperature variations on the chest and uh, our software which is smart can analyze this to say whether the person requires a follow up uh, you know test essentially if there is uh, early signs of breast cancer this early detection is very very important to save lives in breast cancer uh, with the mortality rates uh, going up uh, from 5% to 95% if it is stage 4 versus stage 0 so this is what we want to do like you know detect uh, breast cancer early and uh, save uh, many lives and it's not just about uh, mortality even after the surgery the quality of life uh, and health of the person is going to be much much better uh, if actually the disease is detected early now uh, in this uh, case uh, the ai enablement is is very very critical because now these tools can be used by uh, simply skilled health workers and uh, also because our device is very portable it's just like a 1 liter water bottle we can actually put it in our backpack and sort of you know take it to uh, large scale screenings outside the hospital not just inside a hospital of course our solution is unique around the world i mean it's globally unique having said that uh, the fact that it's radiation free and portable makes uh, this large scale screening possible as well as kind of what you what we can call as any time anywhere screening possible and by low skilled workers so so with that uh, we are hoping to actually bring down the cost of screening and uh, make an affordable high quality healthcare possible at scale 
Yeah, true. I mean, and the fact that it is so portable um, makes it such a great solution, right? I mean, physically, one is digital penetration is one thing, but the fact that you also need physical stuff, and unless that is made portable, that it obviously is not a solution. That's a great point. Krishna, you know, you were among the early players in the agri tech space, a person who left a job at with uh, GM to uh, to start Krishna uh, to start Crockett. Yeah. What what, yeah, thanks, what thanks, was what thanks. was your what was your uh, uh, you know inspiration and what what are you doing now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, I mean, thanks, thanks, Rima. Uh, so I come from G, uh, not GM. Sorry, I'm sorry. My mistake. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 No, no, no problem. So yeah, I, I think uh, we were, I think the first company globally who started talking about uh, bringing data to agriculture, right? So can we make this whole ecosystem data driven? And if you look at uh, now after that long journey, uh, we redefined ourselves as an AI and data led B2B act tech uh, uh, startup or company. Uh, today, and our focus, focus and vision is to make every farm traceable, make it predictable, and also sustainable, right? So improve the per acre value. Uh, while we are doing so, we are also trying to illuminate the uh, dark data because you know today we don't know what is happening uh, with close to five million farms globally, which are hold, hold, hold by the small holders. If you don't know what is happening, how do you really bring support to them, right? And uh, how do you make it more sustainable? And that's, that, that was the thought when we built this uh, uh, crop in platform, uh, which helps the all the uh, uh, you know ecosystem player to organize uh, organize the sector uh, uh, you know manage their farm base uh, digitally make it more traceable understand the risk and manage it well right uh, we started primarily in uh, you know agri domain so we started working with the agri businesses but over a period of time we also felt an importance of bring, bringing the financial inclusion where we started using you know deep learning to see if we can become more predictive and prescriptive and also go back in time to assess a pixel or a farm to say what happened on that farm and what you know what kind of practices were followed what was the yield what crops were grown how the rotation happened what are the water stress and without visiting that particular you know, land mass uh, so we started building those kind of a capability and uh, truly speaking i think it's a uh, it's a marriage of AI, AI and we, at company we say we are building an AI culture for agriculture, right? And we see uh, see that the variables are you know in numbers. It's not like there are five dimension to look at a data. Like if you call it retail, where by location, by region, by inventory. But there are so many variables which are impacting every farm, right? There are thousands and thousands of variables, and then how do you use AI? Uh, you know, is something we are trying to make it more practical. Today, uh, you know, we work with agribusinesses, uh, input and output side both, farm equipment companies. Uh, we work with banks and insurance to help them to understand the risk on that plot where they're trying to lend and bring down their cost of, you know, uh, monitoring so that they can reach out, reach us more number of farmers and they can lend with confidence and even low ticket size makes sense for them. It still become profitable because you're not investing too much in servicing those loans. Uh, at the same time, we work with government and development agencies to support them. Today, we are supporting close to 8 million acres of production in 52 countries. So we today, we primarily started in India, but in the last uh, two and a half years, we have expanded globally and we are also servicing countries like Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, Europe, uh, US and Latin. We saw the problems were same, uh, magnitude was different and everybody needs uh, to make their supply chain more digital, more predictable, and that's where the AI and you know data revenue can make sense, and uh, it worked well for us. So uh, today we operate in 52 countries, and we are going more deep in that. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much what we do. I mean, you were one of those ones who's really seen how data can be used to provide value across the chain, right? and uh, especially around the opening up the fintech uh, layer. Uh, is obviously creating a much more impact to the farmers than anything else. And on the questions of on the on the stuff that you brought about global expansion and uh, the sandbox, we would come about that. We'll talk about a little bit deeper in, later on in this session. Right? 
I'd first like to start off with Karthik. You know, Karthik, your business is something that has, you know, is obviously something existed for very, very long. Versus, uh, you know, a lot of what Krishna, Gita, and Ranjit all brought in was new solutions that were there. You, you entered a place where there were existing supply chains. There was an existing way of doing stuff. And when you started scaling up, so obviously you couldn't, you, you had to think of scale in the beginning. If you didn't think of scale, you would just be a neighborhood uh, vegetable seller. So obviously that's not what you started off with saying you had to be at a particular scale. What were the, what, what did you think in terms of technology? What, what role would technology play in all of this? Um, and uh, where do you see, uh, you know, how have you seen your scaling up go and your technology roadmap also change along the way? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, I think uh, as we, when we started out, our thought process was quite simplistic in the sense that we felt that a reintermediation with a single player will create more efficiencies naturally than the current set of intermediaries who are multiple intermediaries in a supply chain. The cost stack between the farm gate price and what a retailer uh, sells the material to us for comprises the commissions paid out to various intermediaries, which are frankly not a very big part of the stack, but multiple retransports, re rehandlings, and uh, associated shrinkage, wastage, and damage in the supply chain. Uh, our initial view going in was that, you know, if we replace this with, you know, a single collection center, a single distribution center, and a very short supply chain between the two, we would be more efficient. We realized that that's not necessarily true. Uh, you know, when we one considers the corporate costs, uh, that are associated with a company like ours with fairly tough governance standards. Uh, it's very difficult to even being a single step player, uh, make it uh, more efficient than the current supply chain because uh, you know uh, it's the entrepreneur who's running uh, each intermediation step. They're gonna be very, very tight about uh, how they run their operations. The, sec the second challenge which we realized was one of scalability, right? Uh, the, uh, we realized that to scale this business, you can't linearly replicate manually operated collection centers and distribution centers. The cost of management goes up so high and the cost of controls go up so fast that uh, you start bleeding money. It's, uh, it becomes uncontrollable at a certain scale. Uh, the third is of course the acquisition of stakeholders on both ends. Uh, in the initial stage, stages, you work with FEOs, you work with uh, the cl small clusters of farmers through collection centers on the back end, and you work with feet on street on the front end to acquire customers. But that again is very linear in its model. So we realized that you know uh, there are a few things that need to be done differently. Uh, number one is digitization of uh, obviously the entire supply chain, but also uh, you know a digitization of the interaction with the consume the customers on the one end and the farmers on the other end, which is common knowledge. You know, you get customers to come onto an app and place orders on you, the number of feet on street that you need to, the efficiency of your feet on street goes up progressively over time. And there's non-linearity in customer acquisition. Getting customers to come on board digitally is a solvable problem. And it's been done in multiple sectors before. But how do you make your warehouse scalable? How do you achieve non-linearity in uh, replicating your warehouses? That requires automation of a different kind. And that's really what we worked on in the past uh, uh, two years with our platform called Rapid. In Rapid, we're able to forecast to an accuracy of about 73%, which is not bad in this industry. And as a consequence of that, we are able to tell the farmer before they harvest what our requirement is to reasonable accuracy. That gives the farmer enough time to plan for their cultivation and decide whether to supply to us or not, and gives us enough time to plan in case the supplies are not go are going to be different from uh, what the uh, uh, plan was. Uh, the second is how the material moves in the supply chain itself. Most of our activity happens at the collection center itself. Material is graded, processed, and pre-packed at the collection center. Our warehouses simply act as automated cross docks. Crates come in, they're auto-scanned, auto-weighed, automatically allocated to customers and robotized arms push the crates to the relevant uh, customer segments. And then they're placed on pallets for about 70% of our volumes. Only 30% require manual intervention today. Uh, we're working to see how much further can be automated as well. Now this gives us several advantages. Number one, when your warehouse becomes a cross dock, then the stock is restricted to what's there in your collection center. 
and that stock is fungible across multiple warehouses so your system stock comes down and therefore your efficiency becomes better and better as you add more and more warehouses secondly you are not adding a lot of activity or value at the place where you have the least time fresh produce and perishable goods like dairy products which we deal with have to go out instantly to the customer as soon as they come into the city we're not doing a lot of work there as we were doing any more thirdly we use real estate better fourthly there is less stock in the warehouse less labor in the warehouse so social distancing is enabled costs are more contained and therefore you have an answer that's finally efficient compared to the traditional supply chain this has been the keystone to scalability and the ben- uh, we see the benefits of this in both the fresh and the dry supply chains we operate both supply chains and uh, an example uh, of the success is that post lockdown pre lockdown we had eight warehouses post lockdown we have 24 so we were able to replicate our warehouses very quickly despite the lockdown and associated hardships therefore inherently proving the scalability of the model this has been our biggest learning now of course we are digitizing the front end and digitizing our interaction with farmers etc since the core has been made scalable we are able to make the end scalable as well and therefore the model is fine faster did you foresee when you made these investments did you foresee the kind of tech that would be involved in all of these did you see the the depth of these technologies um right from the beginning or you realized as you go along that this required some really cutting edge stuff and how do you trade this uh versus you know what's the technology that's available globally how do you how do you compare them it's a, it was actually a bit of both we did realize that uh, you know uh, a simple intermediation reintermediation made you a trader it didn't make you a tech company or anything disruptive or differentiated and therefore we realized that some elements of uh, work were needed beyond this but a lot of uh, what we added finally came through learnings the forecasting tools that we use use a lot of machine learning and artificial intelligence that's something that came along the way we acquired the skill to do it and then we hired the right people and we had to build that anew now as we go forward we are also learning that you know the biggest shift that we made in our own minds is that we are not a farm to fork company we are a soil to sale company uh, you can't sustainably build an organization like us purely as a trader or a transaction processor we have to get into the agriculture itself there we are working with a number of startups and leveraging the technologies that are already developed to actually improve the process of cultivation itself so these are the, these are the new learnings that are coming along and doing so in a scalable way where for example today we cover 2660 acres under our outgrow agricultural extension program in the first year we covered 70 to 80 acres and the second year we covered 250 acres so we learned how to make it scalable over time and therefore we are able to build that out so it's been a bit of uh, uh, both in terms of how we have come about this in terms of the tech that we use they frankly it's a blend a lot of the digital tech that we use is probably more advanced than what's available out there a lot of the physical tech is actually what uh, you know the automotive world calls as frugal engineering you know warehouse automation is no it's a standard technology it's available globally but how do you automate it at our cost structure is something that we had to learn from scratch interesting frugal automation is, is the word that you use because like which i think is important especially when you're looking at the next billion and you're looking at it globally as well because um uh the the cost structures are very very important uh, uh in many of these supply chains right? um on the same uh, note krishna when you were looking at at digitizing obviously you're coming from the other end and uh, you are uh, playing uh, from a different perspective in the agri supply chain and when you were looking at investments that have to go into the space what were you foreseeing it from a technology perspective and uh, did you when you started off did you see india as the as the as a market did you see the global market how did and and accordingly what were your tech investments that you made yeah so i think uh, when we started we always aspire to become a, a, a global company uh for the sheer nature of agriculture right every company has got uh, farmers and agriculturists who need the support now we choose a different route we choose b2b we wanted to work with b2b businesses who are interfacing with these farmers and uh, and data become very imperative right so everybody wants to do a better forecast as uh, uh, 
as Karthik was mentioning, that the I mean, SC works with plus minus forty percent forecast, so they will <clears throat> they will plan for more acreage because they don't know what will happen at the end of the season whether some farms will uh, you know be productive or or there are some crop failures which will hit their production production and processing capability as well. So when we looked at looked around, <clears throat> this was the biggest challenge. Uh, uh, the primary uh, primary interface or last mile connect with the farms were, were the farm managers who were mostly using uh, pen and paper or farm diary or Excel to manage this information. And that used to flow you know, uh, to, the, to the headquarters, to the procurement manager, quality managers. And by the time all these informations were collated, uh, there's not enough time to react to it, right? Because a lot of things have changed. It's agriculture is a four month crop or six month crop. Uh, and you need to know information uh, at, the, uh, at the speed. And that was the biggest opportunity we saw. Uh, and we also understood that uh, the tech which we are going to build ha will have to play two parts. One, it will be used, consumed internally to make the uh, process more efficient, more digital, uh, more illuminating from the fact uh, to get, uh, get more better forecast or predictability into the business. At the same time, it is also going to be consumed externally, which is their customer who are the farmer, who are actually working on their farmland and it's like a factory. Uh, uh, in order to ensure the better quality and better yield, they need support. That how do you adopt, uh, for example, how do you adopt, uh, uh, adopt a, uh, a different variety which can fight the climate change, right? Or uh, how to do a, uh, why variety which require a, a little bit different practices so hand holding of the farmers were required so tech we blended the tech into two parts one how it can make the uh, industry intelligent uh, with respect to data and then how it's going to make the farmer uh, intelligent when they are doing their uh, farming right and how the seamless everybody i mean seamless flow of data and information in a manner you can consume uh, in in order to do that there were three layers to be built one this industry didn't have the you know, adoption of technology. So digitization was not there in the industry because the infrastructure were not there. Telecom industry were not there, 4G were not there, smartphones were not there when we started. Uh, so uh, so that, that was something which was solved uh, over a period of time. Uh, and and, and, uh, and uh, uh, so that, that need to be solved and it got solved over a period of time, as I mentioned. Uh, I think 2014 was a time when uh, these were yeah. open to the Riverside. Uh, so the first ability, uh, ability we wanted to build or to give it to the industry was to organize their data and organize the relationship which they have with their farmer in a more digital way. And that's where the first product comes into picture, which is Smart Farm, which is a SaaS-based product like Salesforce, Salesforce or many other products, but much more deeper connect with the uh, interface with the farmer as well as internally to uh, do better. Uh, and then the second layer was more of analytics and BI, which was replicating, you know, uh, uh, more reports on quality, procurement, forecast, which is sitting on the top of the data, which which is getting this ties uh, from different farms. And the third layer was predictive, which is an AI layer, AI and ML layer, where you know you you are learning from those data sets, and you are helping the organization to become more predictive in terms of what what can happen, let's say next three months or for example, what could the yield you can expect from the, you know, your production base? Uh, so that was the third layer we started building, building it. Now the question was, how do you, how do you produce the data and how do you serve that information? Because at one end spectrum, you have a farmer who has to consume AI and the other spectrum, there is a, an organization who has not used much of technology at the, you know, at the uh, upstream. And they, are, they have to consume the information and act upon it. So the challenge for our design UI UX to produce the data in a manner that it can be consumed by people in the, and very, very actionable in a simple way. So you can run your complex deep learning, you know, 3D CNN or whatever, or a GAN network. They don't, don't, they don't have to do anything with that, right? So they don't, they don't want to know. They want to know, you know, what's the outcome and how do I consume and how do I become a better farmer when I'm working on, a, on my farms. So we built various technology, right? So we used, I think we are using, when we compare our technology uh, and we look at the parallel globally, I think we are 
one of the advanced, uh, we have reached one of the uh, advanced stages of machine learning and AI with the investment we did over uh, in the past. And today using that, I think we are able to, uh, you know, predict a country like Nigeria or India at a pixel level, right? So what happened, and building a history of that pixel and then forecasting about that pixel, how this pixel is going to perform over a period of time. Uh, we are working in Pradhan Matri Fasal Bima Yojana where we are helping the government to make the payout faster because then we can look at the pixel by pixel of a grump and chat and tell you what, what's the crop breakup and what's the health and what you can expect in the coming days. So the crop cutting experiment was augmented. Uh, for one of our customers, <clears throat> large customers in Africa, they wanted to tag every farms in Nigeria around six states, which is 70% of the country, that which farm is on the sorghum and which farm is on the corn. Can you just tag that? You know, and historically as well, and for the current crops, so that they can make a decision how to procure, how to you know, make their procurement planning. And they also want to know where the harvest will first start and how much will reach to the funding. So you, you can, once you have this uh, ability of a digital data, which can, uh, and that builds a trillions of data sets to train your models. Now, once that infrastructure is ready, you can build multiple solutions on top of it, which is facing towards the farmer, which is facing towards the agronomist. Uh, in fact, it's also going to help you to reduce your losses over the supply chain. I mean, today, uh, close to 50% uh, uh, of the producers getting lost uh, during pre-harvest pre and post-harvest, right? And, uh, and, and that means we are wasting around 30% of the water as a resource. So how do we... How do you manage that well? Uh, don't put a lot of stress on the you know, resources which we have and you know, grow uh, more with less. So that's, a, that, that's where I, I see the technology is playing a role and on a daily basis, how it can help a farmer to adopt technology in a simple fashion. And yeah. And did you start, uh, uh, did you think of all this on day one? Or you started with, you know, with India as the, as the, as the base? I think I come from an organization which was very, very data driven. So I was a part of the Six Sigma, Lean Sigma at GE, who pioneered, pioneered the data and how to solve problems looking at the data, right? And make, make a, uh, you know, uh, uh, and I was also certified in that. One of the projects which I, I was working uh, there was, uh, which was discussed that, you know, all the, all the planes has got GE engines. They are generating so much data. Uh, how do you how do you use that data to make uh, that industry more efficient in terms of fuel consumption, right? So when the when you are switching off one engine versus other engine in the when the pilot is trying to land, is also also going to tell you how much uh, you know fuel was consumed. So if you delay, you are consuming more fuel, right? So when you when you uh, so all those data sets was uh, we were trying to use to make this industry more data driven and I also save the cost for them. And I, I, you know, we, we use the same analogy at a crop in, that every farm is a factory and how do you use to, the data to make, you know, optimize it for, uh, optimize it for the, you know, improving the particular value, not only for the farmer, but for the whole, whole ecosystem. Yeah. So I think it was blended in a very initial thought, but the idea was, you know, there was no data when we started. The first thing was we the smart smart farm was for uh, to roll out a platform which helped this industry to become more structured, structure the structure the farming data not only in India but also globally, yeah. on which you can Absolutely. build your machine learning and AI. Yeah. Yeah. But one thing that you really brought out the fact that for all these stakeholders, the UI UX becomes so important, and especially yeah. giving them just that that bit of information they need to to interact with because. That was the real book for them. Yeah. Geeta, you were you were using AI and ML for a completely different purpose. Right? I mean, essentially uh, looking at breast cancer early stage. Now you were also at the same time uh, looking at the fact that these are established uh, markets where there are uh, where there are already technologies that's available. Right? And um, so how did you see the whole thing? Like, I mean, did you see yourself as, as be creating, competing better technologies for today or uh, improving the existing technologies for, uh, the, um, uh, for, uh, uh, for the future? How do you see yourself as? And uh, did, you, 
did you see the global market on day one? And if so, were you, uh, were you looking at, uh, uh, in, how did you structure your thought process um, differently, saying that you know, this is for the global market and hence I need to do it differently versus just a, a solution for uh, in India for the, uh, detecting say, the breast cancer early stages? Yeah, so I think uh, the main initial basis of our complete Niramai solution, as you said, is sort of basically completely built on innovation in tech, which is in AI and ML. And um, if you look at it uh, from a holistic perspective and a global perspective, what we're attempting to fill is a huge gap that exists globally in the cancer tests that are available today for detecting breast cancer. You know, if you look at uh, the existing methodologies like mammography, which is the standard, it does not work on women under 45 years of age. And there are so many women who are uh, uh, getting detected with breast cancer, almost like 50% of them are 50, under 50 in India, particularly where there is a more younger population, right? And so, so there is absolutely no test. Hand is the only way they're detecting, which basically means they're detecting a 25 millimeters of cancer to start with, so which is stage three, stage four by definition. So, so that's a huge, huge gap. And also women above 45, also 50% of them have what's called as dense breasts, where our current te the existing technologies were not working. So this is what we saw as a huge gap that exists in the industry, to use the term that uh, you know, Krishna used, right? In the whole industry globally, this is a huge gap. This is, and this continues to be. And that is what we initially want to address and we continue to address as, as an innovation from India, hopefully global and so on and so forth, right? By enabling not X-ray based analysis, which is another big thing, right? You know, how can you use X-rays, radiation-based tests to detect cancer because the, the lady cannot use the test more often because she, her risk to cancer increases. Here is a test which has to protect her from cancer and it can eventually, when used multiple times, can create. I mean, you know, it's it's crazy, right? So 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 we didn't want to use X-ray. So we said, why don't we use another sensing methodology? And we looked at multiple imaging mod mod modalities that were existing. And thermal imaging sort of, you know, is something that uh, we learned was used long, long ago. And it was almost like set aside because it's very hard to interpret because when there is a cancer, there's higher uh, temperature, but uh, just high temperature doesn't mean cancer. There may be several reasons why something can be a high temperature. So that's what the perfect fit, right, for AI and machine learning is how I thought as an AI scientist, right? You know, it's, it's usually like that. But in this case, it was a, a, a good uh, match, I guess, because that's what we found out when we started uh, developing algorithms, we were able to get uh, you know, very, very good accuracy. Now at the stage where we definitely can claim higher sensitivity, better cancer detection rate than mammography, that existing test. And, and the fact that our test works for women of all ages. So we started off from that particular gap and how do we fix that gap? Now, because the solution is in our hands and also, uh, you know, initially we started off with a 25 lakh kind of a camera because that was a high resolution. Um, you know, all of us, like we were wanted to think good, right, for, for the masses, right? And so we said, okay, how can we bring down the cost of this solution? So that was the next step when we thought, thought through. And we said, okay, can we make the tech work at much lower resolution of the imaging so that we can have, we can bring down the uh, CapEx, right? So we've now right, uh, brought it down to almost one third of that cost uh, of the CapEx itself, which is uh, incidentally, um, you know, one twentieth of the, existing solutions, right? You know, we are talking about our own uh, uh, you know, um, improvement in uh, cost aspect of it. And so because of that, we started making it affordable. Second biggest thing we did was, I guess, um, improving our AI algorithm so that, you know, you do not need a clinician all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm very boldly saying that clinicians out there, please excuse me, this is a case where clinicians cannot go, you know, the, the AI can do the best it can, right? So in that sense, we fine tune the algorithms in a way that it automatically can generate a provisional reporting. And when it does that, what happens is that we obviously, you know, reduce the operational expense and uh, you could also do real time Things, right, which is very important when you go to rural areas and do a camp or something, people come from different villages, right? And so there'll be three Sharadamas and we always had it. Like one of them was, not, was abnormal when we go, went back after a week with all the reviews being done by doctors and so on. I mean, we couldn't trace her place. You know, it was really, then that's when I thought, okay, we should really make it real time. You know, we have to give the report immediately, right? 
And, uh, you know, I, I probably can claim this as well, that nowhere in the world today, there is a tool which can automatically generate an S or no, right, for cancer in real time and within 15 minutes, right, including the test time, right? So that is what we kind of, you know, enabled the test to do, the AI uh, element of it. And then came the problem of uh, uh, usability, right? And you mentioned about simple user interfaces. So we said, okay, so far, you know, you know I was doing screening in villages and all at that time, like two years ago. So obviously we'll have to hand it over to people at, you know, who can operate this. And uh, so, so uh, these were almost like health workers and so we made, first of all, the UI very simple, but they started making mistakes in the images that they're capturing, right? You know, you know, they were taking images very far and not cooling well and so on, right? And obviously every image was being observed on this because we wanted to make sure we do the right thing for the end user. So there was always a person, you know, it's all cloud hosted. So person inside the office watching you know, how people are uh, screening, are they doing any errors and so on. Obviously next, uh, innovation had to be, you know, let's build the tech to figure out if the imaging is correct or not. And again, real time, right? So that we can guide the end user and, and the health worker to do the right thing, capture the images in the right protocol. So that was a bunch of new uh, innovations we did. And all of these sort of, we have many patents and the last four or five patents are just about how do we make sure that the image taken by the uh, health worker is up to the quality that is needed because obviously garbage in is garbage out. So we wanted to make sure that the uh, image is of high quality. So, so I think we have come a long way in trying to sort of automate. Next big thing was uh, basically even um, when you want the doctors to be uh, uh, on role, they were taking like, you know, uh, four days to sign up, uh, sign and so on, you know, certify and so on. So that again, we came up with the mobile app which as soon as the, you know, submission happens, uh, you know, the expert gets a notification and uh, a panel of radiologists are there. So we kind of, you know, balance it out and so there is an immediate response whenever the radiologist has been involved. So these were all from the innovations from a tech perspective. Now, uh, when we think global, uh, some other country or something like that, healthcare is very different, right? You know, as you would imagine, uh, it's, it's a regulated environment. And we, again, uh, because it is, um, about a disease which can be almost like a life and death kind of a decision. So we have to be uh, very careful about the quality or the, or the accuracy of the results that we're giving. So very stringent clinical trials and clinical validation is absolutely needed so that you know it enables scale, right? Um, be, it at, be it in uh, the villages or when used in the hospital. So we invested a lot of time and effort and uh, to, to make sure that uh, our solution is clinically validated uh, all along, right, uh, in reputed hospitals. Now, when we come to expanding to other countries, the same thing holds. Uh, one is the clinical validation piece, as well as the regulatory clearances. Every country has its own regulatory, um, um, you know, principles or guidelines, essentially. Of course, there are a bunch of countries regulated by a particular organization. So, for example, the CE mark, uh, you know, pretty much applies to the whole of Europe and many other countries in Southeast Asia and and other countries in Asia and also Middle East uh, kind of uh, are uh, slightly delta over uh, CE mark, right? a slight uh, modification. There's also another regulatory body for those of uh, you in the audience who are actually uh, working on health tech. Uh, and this is something I learned recently. It's called MDSAP, which tries to, it's called, uh, look for the expansion. It's, it's a long one, multi-device, something, something. So basically it tries to uh, provide you a certification for five uh, big countries, Australia, Canada, US inclusive, right? So, so uh, Japan and others. So, so that's sort of another uh, big regulatory thing that we've started off on your 90% in for both CE and MDSA. This will just make us qualified to actually get into other markets. Otherwise, of course, there are several markets for uh, screening. They say it's not that regulated. You can go in, but we don't want to take any, um, you know, chances in sort of, you know, breaking any laws and we don't want anybody coming behind us. So we, are, we really want to go uh, with full uh, regulatory clearances for every country. And we have that laid out. Uh, of course, US FDA is, uh, is the holy grail and that is also on uh, in the process of uh, getting clearance. So the regulatory piece and the clinical trials are two new elements that get added uh, to enable scaling uh, for healthcare per se. And last but not the least, I also want to make a comment uh, Rima, on the process aspect of it, because nothing is scalable if, unless it is repeatable, right? You know, I mean, and, and it's something that uh, you can um, 
you will be able to catch hold of a health worker and train her to the extent that uh, you know there is uh, the same result that is coming either when it's done by the founder or the best experts in our team or the health worker who's just joined last week, right? So how do we get to this? For example, we started home screening uh, today because of COVID and so on. And again, we sort of have a manual for home screening, process manual for home screening. And this thinking is very, very new. In the last six to eight months is where we have started thinking process, process, process for everything. Because otherwise everything was done by the software. You just need to upload and things happen. But even on the ground, the operations, exactly what are the questions to ask to the end user? All of these things right, are processified now, which uh, makes us very confident. We have a training department. We have regular three, every three months refresher course and so on and so forth. right? These things uh, you know, are not obvious, but when you start doing things at scale, these become very, very important. And I can go on and on, but I guess I'll pause here. No, absolutely. What you brought up, repeatability, is very important, especially because a lot of this, which involves uh, these sectors that we're talking of, I'm sure Karthik has the same issue, like what he said, that what you do in one warehouse to be able to take it across to multiple warehouses, because you're talking of not just digital, using a digital layer, but there is so much of, of human intervention that's there that uh, repeatability becomes a major, major criteria. That's right. Ranjit, no, you have you come from a completely different space than what all these guys have been talking about. You were talking, you entered an area where uh, uh, earlier people only had books to read in their local languages, and they were just consumers. Now you're going. Now you're talking of millions of people wanting to write and become authors, not just consumers. Right? Uh, could you tell a bit about uh, you know how you started off and the fact that languages when you started off um, in the last couple of years obviously the the language tech has become more and more sophisticated. Uh, you are now talking of the language being the uh, uh, you know this automation to such an extent that you know whether it's using audio whether it's using video and there's lots of interventions that have come in now. But uh, when you started off, what was what was the kind of tech what did you think as being the core tech that was there and how has that evolved? I think you're on mute, Ranjit. Yeah, I just unmuted. I think I might be slightly uh, weird from this perspective. So when I think of uh, essentially any company, not just Patlipi, I primarily try and put like the majority of my focus on what is the core value proposition that the business stands for. And then be it technology or be it marketing or be it the strategy or anything else, it should essentially kind of just support that core value proposition. So in our understanding, the core value proposition of Pratlipi, uh, when we started thinking about it back in 2014, uh, August or July of 2014 was essentially that it is going to be a place where people can, like the storytellers can basically come and share their stories with each other and they can basically talk to each other and things like that. So that essentially meant that like we did not think of technology as first per se. We thought of okay, what is the minimum piece of technology that we can build so that this particular use case kind of gets solved. So very early on, in fact, our product was uh, like as simple as you can imagine. It was basically just a blog where we would basically create author's profile, uh, upload their content, and that's largely it. Like there was not even a signing functionality. Primarily because we wanted to test out whether the value proposition itself makes sense. So once we got confident of that and we reached to a slightly bigger scale, then we started like facing a problem that the number of writers who were sending us their stories, that was becoming too much. So then we figured, okay, now we can't really manually do this or we'll have to hire a big team of data entry guys to do this. So that is when we essentially build that, okay, now writers can kind of create their own profiles and they can upload stuff on their own. Uh, then slowly, slowly, like things like this kind of just kept on adding up. So for example, early on, let's say for moderation of content, we primarily only had like users can flag content which is uh, like which should not be on the platform either because of copyright violation or because of uh, hate speech or anything else. And that was fine when we had like 100,000 stories. But as the number of stories became into millions, uh, then a lot of stories would have like zero readers or five readers. Then it becomes again harder. So that is when we basically, for example, went back and said, okay, now this problem, we cannot depend on just the users alone to flag something. We probably want to figure it out much earlier than that. So that is when we went back and built our own copyright detection models, uh, our own pornography detection models, our own hate speech detection models. 
So we always kind of started with the user uh, and the use case first. And if it can be solved without technology, that's probably better. Uh, if it cannot, or if it cannot be solved in an efficient manner, then we look at okay, what is the best piece of technology to solve this particular problem. So Perfect. I think over the time, that's how it has evolved. So quickly, you know, all of you have spoken about what you have worked on. What do you all see as the opportunity in India and globally? And uh, you know, um, uh, do you all see this as a huge opportunity? What is the kind of capital that you will require to get there? Uh, do you think that capital is available? Karthik. I think uh, uh, the opportunity is obviously immense. We are in food and we're barely scratching the surface of uh, you know, the full supply chain. So we think that uh, uh, a large part of the sub supply chain will evolve or transform itself into versions of what we have tried to build. And it, it, this is not going to be a winner takes all market by any stretch of imagination. I imagine that many of the current intermediaries will also build their build smarter supply chains, and uh, they will they they are highly entrepreneurial by nature, and uh, that gives us a bunch of opportunities. One is of course our own linear expansion, and the second is unbundling of the pieces of technology that we have built as well, and we can offer many of those as a service. We're restricted to the southern half of India. There may be players in the northern half of India who want to leverage some of the technologies. We have a distribution management system. We have a a warehouse automation system. We have a farm management system. There may be clients who want to do that. We I mean, each of your pieces, each of your technology pieces can become global companies on its own, right? Correct. And we actually have inbound queries for this from uh, Southeast Asia and the Middle East as well. It's just that, uh, you know, especially the distribution management system pieces, etc. there is a lot of interest inbound. <coughs> in We're saying, let's, let's figure it out. Let's perfect it ourselves and let's uh, stabilize before we start uh, looking at uh, unbundling what we've done. But uh, the, the non-physical part of what we do is transferable globally, especially in similar emerging markets. And do you think the capital is available for that? I think uh, it's available in parts, let me put it that way. I think uh, one of the challenges in the agri space is that uh, you know, each experiment is at least a crop cycle and sometimes three or four crop cycles. Uh, therefore, when we work with technology, for us to see the outcome of that technology takes several crop cycles. And therefore, you know, that's kind of money that's gone in without apparently yielding results for you immediately. So the question, the, you know, the, the way capital is raised today, especially if you're looking at pure equity raises, is uh, that, you know, you demonstrate a certain scale and a multiple of uh, that scale is what uh, becomes your valuation. And to that extent, you know, based on the dilution that you're prepared for, you get more capital coming in. So in that situation, there often becomes a contest between where you put your money, whether you put it on the technology that you're supposed to put it in or whether you put it to scale the business faster. Mm -hmm. So I would have liked to, and I would still like to put in more mm -hmm. than what I'm putting in the back end. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, there are practical considerations uh, to this. What would help is a patient capital, which values uh, you know, uh, uh, the business differently based on the promise of what the technology is likely to deliver if it uh, clicks, rather than on a com commercial valuation platform. That's my expectation. Uh -huh. Got it. So uh, Krishna, you would, have you had a similar uh, uh, in terms of, you know, what do you see as a capital that's required for you to go global? And uh, what is the kind of capital that's available for it? Okay. I think uh, from the capital perspective, I don't see uh, uh, much gap there. I see there's a lot of interest, not only from India, but Southeast Asia, Europe, uh, or US as well. You know, a uh, lot of investors are interested to fund deep tech or tech companies or data-driven companies, or for that matter, SaaS, B2B. And, and that's a, a quadrant we, we put ourselves into. And uh, uh, and I think there is enough capital available if you have a, a brilliant idea which can scale and which can go global from India. Now the advantage of being in India is it's a very very it's a 1.3 billion population, very diverse problem set, diverse kind of users. You can build your tech here, 
at the very India is a perfect sandbox, right? I mean, you have so sandbox. many problem <laughs> yeah. statements, right? Yeah. I mean, I yeah, think so whether it is Kartik, whether it's uh, you or, you know, with Ranjit, I mean, the kind of problems that we have, problem statements that we have, is yeah. so immense that, you know, it's a sandbox that you can pretty much resolve for every global, you know, you would be able to get any geography, their problem statement, you would have faced it in India. Yeah, 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 and and I look at the cost of building a tech, right? So uh, if you are building this tech in the US, it will cost you three x. You are building in India, <clears throat> you are uh, building at the lower cost. The talent pool is great, great here, uh, right from product design, tech. In fact, the AI, I mean, you know, uh, you'll see, uh, you are seeing a lot of uh, uh, people are picking it up, and uh, uh, right from you know, Indian Institute of Science. And all the premier institute, you'll find a lot of people who have already done hands-on. Uh, you have uh, many, uh, you know, leaders in AIML who are, wants to come back to India. And if you look at US and Europe, there are many Indians who are doing a pioneering work in uh, data science and machine learning, which has actually been there, done that. And uh, given a right opportunity, given the scale up scale at which you're trying to solve the problem and the impact of it, I think you can attract them as well. So I don't see uh, from from a, every point of view, I see India is a perfect market to build a deep tech technology, and service to the service to the global global market as well. Uh, I don't see why we will not have the equal opportunity. Uh, I still, I, I think one thing which we, we need to really address is the exits. Uh, the more exits for the investors, which build the confidence as well, because post city C, uh, you know. Uh, really people start looking at the multiplier factor, right? At what uh, valuation we are picking up the equity and what will be our exit. Right? So at least three X from there on. So, and if you're at CDC, you are talking about a you know, 700, uh, 700 million to a billion dollar exit, just to answer their questions. And I think if the entrepreneurs will start thinking about that. Uh, you know, how, how, do you, how do you build them up? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, that that's something need to be addressed, but I think there are enough, uh, you know, uh, investors who are looking at uh, good uh, products or good company to invest in. Yeah. Right. Bef uh, you know, there are some audience questions, but before that, quickly, Ranjit, I want to ask you a question. That you know, when uh, you were making your investments, did you in uh, uh, did you go after the technology, you know, or did you go after getting the consumers on board? Uh, essentially your customers on board. Where did you make those investments and uh, would you do it differently were you to do it today? I think and did the capital help you back whatever you had in mind as well? So primarily we invested in making our user experience better, both on the reader side and writer side. Uh, a lot of times it meant investment in technology, but sometimes it also meant investment in, for example, just organizing small events or um, having a slightly bigger tool or better technology for our own internal team. So we primarily focus on just, in fact, this is something that we still take pride in. Uh, both our employee NPS and our customer NPS are like one of the highest in the world. And that's primarily because that's what we have focused a majority of our time and money both on. Uh, so I think money has definitely helped there. Uh, even, though, even though if you remove everything tangible, just the fact that you have enough money in the bank gives you as well as your team some peace of mind as well that you won't have to worry about running out of money very soon. So I think it has definitely been helpful. Okay. And would you do things differently? Some things, yes. What would you do differently? I think most importantly, uh, especially in the first two, three years, I think I was still not secure enough in my role and my position. So I was still kind of trying to hedge uh, like what I was doing and what I was thinking a little bit too much. I think if I had to do it again, I would probably, and knowing what I know today, I would probably want to be a little bit bolder, a little bit even more aggressive than what I was, and just focus on one or two or three like key things at a time instead of trying to solve everything that comes uh, just on day zero. But like, thinking about everything on day zero is just not really the best use of your time. I'm sure the others will also echo it, and I would uh, the entrepreneurs of the audience can definitely take from that, right? Uh, there are two questions. First one, I'll take one which is you know addressed to most. What says that uh, stack for good companies? Uh, um, did you face valuation challenges? Were they 
valued lower than uh, you know the other SaaS companies or B two B companies that may be there. Did you have uh, uh, um, any challenge in the valuation? Would any of you would like to take that up? Yeah, maybe I can uh, take it up. Uh, I I think the, you know from the industry. Uh, I mean, vertical we come from the you know benchmark in the market, right? The multiple of ARR, um, and uh, the the only thing it the COVID has really brought some impact. Uh, the people started looking at uh, uh, whether the business will sustain in adverse conditions. Uh, so market has really corrected itself, but I think still it's picking up. Uh, being in, you know, being in AI data, ag tech, uh, I don't see why it should lead to a lower valuation uh, if you are if you have that growth uh, growth part. Uh, but if you have a parallel parallel uh, parallel examples of exit in different part of the world, which also gives a lot of confidence to the investors to you know sometimes uh, go much much higher than the uh, average uh, multiple on the ARR. That's what we have also seen. Yeah. yeah. The other question is around the fact that, um, you know, this is something that I'm sure that all of you have faced, which is one thing that uh, when you're doing the last mile through a SaaS solution, um, is B2C possible, especially when you're talking of, uh, of uh, a customer segment that's not willing to pay? And would you rather do B2B? Right. Um, uh, is this something that uh, uh, you know, any of you would like to answer that? Which is very valid, right? I mean, because a B2B, you could be bringing in some value to them and hence could be addressing it. Now, if, uh, uh, Ranjit, I know it's the fact that you don't have it with B2B layer in between after you're doing B2C. Uh, but are there any thoughts of, do you think that if there was another B2B layer that would help? Or any of you others might have. Yeah. At least in my opinion, not just with Pratlipi, but with other companies where I'm involved as a friend or advisor over there. Uh, B2B is definitely easier to monetize, uh, but that is just one of like one of many, many parameters of why you should start X company versus Y company. Right? You don't just consider one parameter. Uh, so I think B2C, it's definitely possible that it takes longer for you to get to profitability uh, or to get to cash flow positive, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. Even for, and I think, uh, that was a valid point that the number of both like people's ability to pay as well as like the technical know-how of how to pay uh, would still be much, much lower for consumers than it would be for enterprises. Having said that, at least in my opinion, that's more a function of time. Uh, and like, I think for that, we need slightly more patient founders. And as Kartik was saying earlier, slightly more patient capital. Uh, but outside of that, I don't think like we can make a generic statement uh, whether B2B or B2C is particularly better uh, without knowing more about the use. Now, if, if I can, uh, uh, on top of uh, uh, Ranji, I think these are two, you know, two different kind of businesses who are trying to build out there, right? So B2C have a very different appetite. B2B has a very different approach. Uh, if you are set out to do both, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, you have to see how, 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 I mean, how, I mean, you have to change, if you're a B2B company and you want to get into B2C, I think you have to change your whole business model. Right? because it doesn't work that way. Uh, yeah. If your question is around, can, can we see more uh, B2B, B2C approach in ag? And is there an opportunity lying there? Uh, I think immense, right? So the, the, there is opportunity in B2B and people are out there to solve that problem and uh, it's a different problem to solve. And B2C has a very different, uh, say a nature of problem set is different, right? Your customer is a, a single farm owner and his challenges will be very, very different than the you know, B2B guys. So opportunity is immense. I think it's a timing issue. Maybe another five years uh, when the more, more uh, you know, people in rural India will be transacting and using smartphone, internets. Uh, I think there's a time it will pick up very, very fast. And I think people will not like to miss the boat. I think this is the right time to build something, be there when, when that inflection point is there. Yeah, I'm sure. So there have been questions to, sorry. Yes. I just wanted to add to that because we didn't refer to B to B to C. Because at Miramai, we believe in partnering with the middle B, that is partnering with enterprises and big organizations mm -hmm. to reach to their customers. So that we have found to be an excellent go-to-market uh, channel and we continue to sort of, you know, uh, uh, strive that uh, uh, pathway B to B to C. 
where we, for example, partner with uh, NGOs on the ground so that they can, uh, you know, uh, collect people at a particular location so that we can do the screenings. Instead of we going to different villages and getting all the people together, it's always good to partner with, let's say, microfinance organizations who already have the roots and network in the, you know, the consumers uh, that we want to at, uh, attract, right? As well as, let's say, insurance vendors as our partners so that they have their own, uh, you know, clients Got coming it. in. B2B to B2 C you found to be a very good um, so, way of it. Uh, I mean, YouTube. and yeah, you've got to keep your options open. I mean, essentially, whether you do directly, whether it's through an intermediary or directly to be, I mean, it would be on a case to case basis. But the fact is that at the end of it, that uh, the customer, uh, there is a customer, and as long as you're bringing value to the entire value chain, there would be people who are willing to pay for it. So, you know, if whether it's an end customer or some customer, it's a value chain and what value addition you're bringing is very, very critical, right? There are lots of questions. Is Karthik uh, and uh, Krishna, actually, there are questions around how did you convince farmers to digitize? Um, there's been questions around, uh, um, you know, I, I, uh, ideation, how long did it take you to get to stage one? But, you know, we're really running out of time. And um, so what I'm going to do is the fact I'm just going to give each of you, you know, 30 seconds to a minute where you can quickly say, what would you like the audience who do seem to be a lot of entrepreneurs in the audience for their takeaway. Uh, if you could quickly give a 30 second bite, that will be good. So Ranjit, would you want to start off? Sure. I think my advice would basically just be to stay more focused uh, instead of like trying to do too many things or worrying about too many things, uh, which is easy to kind of fall into that, okay, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. But that's okay. Like just focus on one thing, uh, do that well, and then move on to the next thing. That's nice. Thank you. That was pretty sharp. Yeah. Karthik? I think it's in a, coming from where we come from, it's important to respect the current state. Then we build a future state. I believe the current state always exists for a variety of legacy reasons. Unless we understand why the current state works the way it works, we will not build the right future state. So any disruptive model, I would suggest first start with respecting the current state. Absolutely, I mean, that's a pretty, that's, yeah. Krishna. Yeah. I think I think that I'll reiterate on two things, you know, having a conviction in what you are doing. I need to be, you know, you first need to be very, very convinced. Second, build for scale. Okay? <coughs> Your model should be, uh, you know, should, the problem should be huge enough and it can be scaled uh, scaled to impact a large number of audience. And I think all the things will fall in place, uh, whether it's the funding, customers, because you're solving a very, very complex and large problem, which is set uh, out there. That's good. Yeah, absolutely. And you have to think of scale from day one, right? I mean, because these are problems that is faced by 5 billion people globally, 5, 6 billion. So it's obviously it's scale is very, very critical. Gita. Yeah, I would say follow your passion. Uh, if you want to solve a problem, you'll find ways of, uh, you know, attacking that and then solving all the hurdles. Uh, however, make sure that where is your strength uh, and then um, uh, focus on your core strength and partner for others. You know, it's perfectly fine to find and it's possible to find a win-win situation, uh, but go for your passion, solve it, it'll happen. That is nice. Thank you. Actually, all of it, the fact that, you know, today India is poised to develop technologies which are really cutting edge, which uh, would solve not only the problems which uh, in, in the next billion Indians face, but also 5 billion globally. It's a huge opportunity for all of you as entrepreneurs to build organizations that can solve these uh, problems that uh, we're facing globally. Uh, it's a huge opportunity for investors as well. We look forward to a journey with all of you and uh, look forward to synergies as we go along. Okay. Yeah. Build in India for the world. Thank you, guys. Thanks for sharing your, your experiences. Really a pleasure chatting with all of you. And thanks to the audience. And sorry, some of the questions couldn't be answered, but I'm sure you can get in touch with the entrepreneurs to get um, uh, detailed answers for all of that. Thank you.